So we're now going to start talking about memory and the final pieces of the model of the mind. Now the first piece that we're going to talk about is the long-term memory storage. This is our final box here along our three box continuum. After we have information in our short-term memory, we encode that information as we talked about in the earlier lecture where we might use vivid examples, maybe maintenance and rehearsal. We might also do some self-referencing where we connect that information to our previous experiences and our own understanding and into that we have our long-term memory store. Now long-term memory has a few unique qualities. Um, one is that its function is actually to organize and store information. The capacity in long-term memory is unlimited or at least to the best of our knowledge we have yet to find a limit to that long-term memory. The question that we have is whether or not it's permanent. We do know that with aging access to memories becomes limited. We know that those pathways become sometimes absent if not very difficult to follow. One of the things that I want one of the things that I want to focus on just for a few minutes is the function of organize and storage. The analogy that I like to use is imagine that your long-term memory is a large warehouse and within that warehouse you have it divided up for certain things. You might have an area for personal information, you might have an area for family and friends information and then of course you're going to have an area for academic information. In that area of academic Im information imagine if you will you have a filing cabinet that is dedicated to psychology 101 and within that filing cabinet you have um, drawers okay so you have a standalone filing cabinet and then you have drawers you've already started to organize your information for this course based upon the primary topics that we've discussed so far or that you've been reviewing in the textbook now imagine within a filing cabinet you open up the drawer for let's say evolutionary psychology you open up that drawer and within that you're gonna have several folders you're gonna might have one titled by a key term, maybe natural selection. You might have one titled Charles Darwin. You might also have one titled Evolution of Man. You could have several different things in there. But within each one of those folders you'll have and you'll build information. Research is pretty clear. If you can develop a system of visualization, it actually helps your memory. So if you could literally follow your mind's eye into the warehouse, into the right filing cabinet, into the right drawer within that filing cabinet, and then eventually into the correct file folder for the information within that filing cabinet. That is how we organize memory. Please remember that the model of the mind is a very simplistic theoretical articulation of what's happening in our brain. Our brain is functioning at a much more complex level. Now after we have long-term memory we have our final piece of the puzzle which is retrieval. That's that lower blue area that's moving from long-term memory into our working memory. This is where we're pulling information from those filing cabinets and into our active conscious functioning memory usage. Now we have several different kinds of retrieval cues and I've chosen to stick with the examples that refer to something that you might experience at a college level course. Now if we have a recall retrieval cue that is when you're given an essay. So let's say this essay um, is give us three founding fathers of psychology that made significant theoretical contributions to what we do in modern day times and provide us examples of their research. That doesn't tell you who, that doesn't tell you specifically what, but what it's going to do is it's going to cue you up to go to the filing cabinet, maybe even the filing cabinet drawer that's titled Founders in Psychology. We also see that with short answer. That would be when you take an assessment and you see a blank on the test, but you're not given options to fill in that blank where you would actually have to fill in that content and sticking with our Charles Darwin evolutionary psychology example one of the questions might be Janie believes that she is motivated by blank to attract a strong high income earning partner so you would fill in that blank by looking through that filing cabinet and answering that information just based upon the cues that you've been given. Now that is recall. That's going to be recall. Recognizing is what we do when we have a multiple choice assessment. We're given again a question and what we try to anticipate is how we might answer that question or maybe fill in a blank within that question. So if we go back and I give you the same example again about the evolutionary psychology where we talk about Janie. She is primarily motivated by 
blank to find a high income earning partner you would have maybe three four or five options below that that is recognizing your objective there is to look amongst the options that you're given and identify which one would best complete that statement or answer that question relearning if any of you have ever had a seasonal sport I for example am a snowboarder and every year when I strap on my board I have to learn that muscle memory all over again for how to get on and off the chairlift this would be the same thing as taking Psych 101 for a second time. You're not learning the concepts fresh and new. You would actually already have filing cabinets and folders within those, but you might add information to those folders. That would be relearning, and that can happen much more quickly than learning information originally. Priming cues and clues. This is when we're given hints to information that allow us to access the correct filing cabinet and the correct drawer and the correct folder. For example, uh, my grandfather was kind of obsessed he couldn't remember how to make corned beef cabbage and then he went home and as soon as he saw his brine pot sitting in his pantry he remembered at that time how you make corned beef cabbage it took the priming of the cue of actually seeing the brine pot to have all of that click for him now we have this issue called context effects anytime we encode information into our filing cabinet we also encode the experiences that we're having in within us and around us. Context effects would be like learning content in a specific environment. If you attend a lecture and you learn the information in that space, being tested in that same space will actually allow you to recall information better because the context is the same. We have what we call mood congruent memories. Some of you will notice that whenever you get upset, um, maybe at a specific person, when you're upset with them, you're able to recall all of the other violations that they have incurred or all of the other ways ways that they have affected you or disappointed you in that uh, context. Those memories might not be easily uh, retrieved unless you are in that mood state. In addition to mood congruency, we also have state-dependent memory. This fits a little bit with context effects and that state-dependent is the state that you're in. So if you're really tired when you're trying to learn content, the research is pretty clear that you would best remember that content if you were really tired at the time that you tried to recall it. Well, some of the most famous studies that they've conducted is they've actually had participants come in who are of legal drinking age. They've given them a list of information to memorize but prior to memorizing that list of information they have them reach a certain degree of intoxication depending upon the individual's metabolism height weight frequency of intoxication they basically have them blow into a breathalyzer and identify at what degree they are intoxicated and then they have those individuals memorize that list and then a few weeks later and sometimes a couple days later they'll bring those individuals back in and they'll give them the opportunity to recall that list when they're sober and what we find is that individuals actually have a harder time recalling that list when they are sober but then when they reach the same level of intoxication that they were at when they originally encoded the information they actually recall with a greater degree of accuracy so that's one of those fascinating things but that's one of the ways we look at state dependency and that's much more than intoxication it could be your degree of hunger it could be your degree of fatigue it could be uh, your degree of consciousness several different things things um, affect how and when we remember things. But 